Okay, I'm about to start the webinar. Good morning and welcome to those joining us. We're just gonna give it a few minutes and let folks join us here. Good morning to those joining us just now. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. If you are joining us on Zoom, if you want to put in the chat where you're joining us from across the Chesapeake Bay, we welcome that. So good morning, everybody. If you are joining us, uh, we are just giving it a minute or two to let folks jump on and join us here. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here. Just letting a few more folks jump on with us. If you want to share in the chat where you're joining us from this morning, I would encourage that. We're just going to get started in just a few seconds here. All right, I think we'll get underway and folks will join us as they, they come on. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Alliance's Breakfast on the Bay Signature Talk Series. For those I haven't met, my name is Kate Fritz and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So as I said, welcome to our Breakfast on the Bay series, um, a signature live talk summer series that is meant to celebrate the 18 million communities, companies, and conservationists who live, work, and play in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So this year, the Alliance is celebrating our 50th anniversary. That means five decades of convening diverse voices and leveraging resources to implement solutions for clean water in your local streams and rivers, and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay. So the Alliance does our work in four program areas, including agriculture, forests, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement across the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed. We have offices located in Annapolis, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, Washington, DC, and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. As an organization, we value three things. We value collaboration, where we believe in partnering across sectors and regions to achieve a larger collective impact. We value inclusivity, and we are partners who demonstrate integrity and amplify diverse voices for an equitable impact. And our last value is, is valuing results, being results-driven, where we drive with data to promote, promote informed action and hold ourselves and our partners accountable for measurable impact. So in celebration of our 50th anniversary, we're bringing 50 stories to life. Each story features individuals, projects, ideas, places, and partnerships representing five decades of restored lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm gonna pop in the chat the link to the, our 50 stories if you are interested in learning more about our history as an organization. So if you're joining us from Zoom and you have any questions throughout the event, please put them in the chat box and I'll make sure they get to our speakers to be answered. Um, and if you're on Facebook, we'll be uh, taking questions in the chat from there as well. And I'll also make sure those questions get into uh, to our speakers. So lastly, I wanna thank our donors who've made this talk possible. Our 50 years of on the ground work would not be possible without you. And in honor of our 50th anniversary, our generous donors have provided a $25,000 gift 
to match any donation made to the Alliance this summer. So if you make a donation today, we'll match your gift one-to-one -one up to $25,000. I've just included a, a link in the chat if you are interested in donating to the Alliance. So this morning, um, we'll, let's get kicked off. We're coming from the banks of the Susquehanna River right just south of Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. We have a few Alliance staff members on site at, uh, with our partners at Shanks Mayor Outfitters. And I'm so excited to turn it over to them uh, soon to introduce Shanks Mayor, uh, to give a little context of where we are and to do a little learning about the Susquehanna River and uh, ecology of the Susquehanna in general. I'll leave lots of, uh, I'll leave time for Liz and Jenna to tell uh, the history of Shanks Mayor Outfitters. Um, but since 1978, Shanks Mayor has been dedicated to emphasizing the environment, cultural, and recreational opportunities of the lower Susquehanna River area. To further those efforts, Shanks Mayor Outdoor Education Center offers paddle sports instruction, guided paddling and hiking tours, school field trips, corporate outings, environmental and cultural programs, and an outdoor adventure camp for kids. Shanks Mayor's mission is to create an outdoor center catering to individuals and groups of all ages interested in the history, natural resources, and environmental importance of the Susquehanna River Valley and the Chesapeake Bay. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna Mitchell Beckett, who is our Pennsylvania State Director, who's in uh, Shanks Mayor Outfitters, and we'll get started with our event. All your- All right. Can you hear us okay? Awesome. Yep, you're coming through fine. All right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I wish you could see the view that we have. It's an absolutely gorgeous day, and we're looking um, right onto the Susquehanna River and in this beautiful, beautiful building. And I'm here with Liz, one of the owners of Shanks Mayor. Um, and I was wondering if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about the history of this beautiful place and this beautiful business that you well, thank you. Um, we actually started in 1978 and basically began as a passion for outdoors, the outdoors in general. We love to backpack and cross-country ski and we're into canoeing at the time and, and, the, and we wanted to be self-employed. We were on Trump, young on Trump and yours, and um, we just decided to make our hobbies our, our you know, past, our, you know, our business. Um, so we uh, started in downtown New York and um, built the business there and really recognized early on that we didn't want to just be a retail operation. We really wanted to get people one-on-one -on -one with the outdoors and the activities that we were involved in. So we rented a site here at low level, a small building. And back in those days, we were into windsurfing. So we, um, we ran a windsurfing school there and, and then that evolved into the paddle sports, which is very big for us right now. So all along the way, we not only wanted to teach people a safe and enjoyable way to, to you know, kayak or, or windsurf uh, or stand up paddleboard now, um, we really wanted to make a point of how important it is to be a steward of the environment and, and to care about you know, what, you're, what you're using and impacting when you're out there enjoying your pastime. So that evolved into um, the lessons, as I mentioned, but then you know, doing corporate outings um, and, and just you know, kids camps and just getting real creative with things that we could do uh, on the water to connect people, not only from, from the shop to the gear that they're, that they're using, but then to teach them and then to give them a, a great pathway to enjoying that activity for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we started. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And what about this building? So after being in downtown New York and then sort of, you know, having the, the spot down here, we, we knew this building was always here. Um, we had an opportunity to purchase it in, in uh, the late 1990s. We moved the business here in 97. This was actually constructed as a general store to service the Susquehanna Canal, which ran right in front of the shop. Not only did that happen, but we also have the Mason Dixon hiking trail, which runs right in front of the shop. So for us as an outfitter, it just seemed like the perfect location. We were already using this part of the river to teach, to run tours, to, to do our kids camp. And it just, it just really helped us bring everything under one roof. 
So we were thrilled to have it. Uh, the building has real unique history. The woodwork is American chestnut. The back room was a speakeasy. Um, you know, the front porch is 100 feet long with a fabulous view of the river. That so just everything about the building was, was, you know, a perfect place for us to be and to be able to share it with everybody that comes to visit us. Wow. And, and what about the name? Shanksmere is an old Scottish saying that means to travel by foot. So while my husband's grandfather used it uh, in speaking with him, he was from Dover. We thought it was Pennsylvania Dutch, but it turns out it's actually Scottish. And it means like if you came to town by Shanks Merritt, meant you walked. And since all of our activities are self-propelled, it, it seemed fitting. Beautiful. So you talked a little bit about the canal and, and sort of how this building interacted with the river. Can you share a little bit more about how the, the Susquehanna has changed over the years? Well, it really has changed. You know, when the canal ran, the canal was constructed in the 1830s. Uh, and it was a major uh, commerce highway. You know, we didn't have a big trucking industry, so they moved things all across the state of Pennsylvania by water, by canalways. So the Susquehanna Tidewater Canal was a big artery that went from Wrightsville to Haverty Grace. And in the, in the heyday of, of building in Baltimore and even New York City, a lot of the lumber that we wow. was used to construct those buildings came right by our front door. Wow. So it was really had a unique, unique you know, uh, legacy in, in industry. When the dams were built, uh, Safe Harbor Dam was built in the 1930s, that totally changed the landscape of the river. So it formed an area here, our part of the river is called Lake Clark. And you know, it formed a 10 mile long, mile and a half wide section of the Susquehanna. It's one of the widest sections of the river um, it, it's, you know, we, we see water quality effects daily from runoff and, and all the things that we're all trying to work on to bring attention to. Um, at the same time, we have an area across the river called the Conan-Chihela Flats, which is a, uh, an Audubon important bird area mm -hmm. for migratory birds. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that go into this particular part of the river. Um, you know, when we do pad our paddle tours, we take people to several different areas of the Susquehanna because each of those areas is unique. It has its own story. Um, you know, Lock 15 is different from Lake Clark and, you know, the, the Wrightsville Bridges area is different from what we are down here. So we really try to connect people with those differences and the impacts that that time has had on all of that. You know, you look at our waterway and you know, the Native Americans used it as a highway as well. Um, so there's a lot of history and a, and a lot of stories to be able to put people into um, contact with. Wow. Can you talk a little bit more about all the different programs and activities? It sounds like there's so much that folks can enjoy. With well, there is, and, and we take great pleasure in being able to share all of that, all of those experiences with our customers. Um, uh, you know, the, the paddle tour series, for instance, we tell people, look, if you want to get out on the river and you want to do it safely, because every section of the river is unique, there are different circumstances on each section. So, you know, go on a paddle tour with us the first time and we'll take you through the area. We'll show you the put-ins and the takeouts and the areas of caution. And that way, if you choose to come back to that area again on your own, um, you can do that in a safe manner. So that's a, that's a great way to connect. We have people that are actually intimidated by mm -hmm. the river. So again, we have programs that are geared toward, you know, they're very beginner friendly. And, you know, maybe you've never paddled before. You don't even know how to swim. We will take you out there safely mm -hmm. and comfortably and give you a first, maybe first exposure to the waterway mm -hmm. and, and everything that it has to offer. So we do a lot of beginner friendly programs like paddle and and dine where, you know, we'll take you paddling up at John Wright between the bridges and then you'll go into the restaurant and, you know, have a, have a great meal or sometimes we do that here in our own building. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those kind of things. We run a kid's camp, haven't since COVID, but we did. Um, and we've now got um, adults bringing uh, their kids to our camp where they were when they were kids. So oh. that sort of ages us a little bit, but <laughs> so it is what special. it is. 
um, it's a great, you know, when someone comes in and says, you know, this is my little boy and, you know, I keep telling them about how much fun Shanks Mayor's camp was. So that's, that's great. Um, again, I mentioned our lesson program. That's really important to us. But then we do things like, like you know, uh, stand up paddleboard yoga. Mm -hmm. You know, so we want to get people into that whole zen of being on the water. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, that's something that we've been doing for quite a while. So, you know, it, it's, it's really making those connections. You know, it's one thing to to maybe sell somebody a kayak or a stand-up paddleboard, it, the, the greatest joy is to be able to teach them and, and then know that they're out there enjoying a place that we love so much and, and they're doing it safely and, and, uh, and, and to the, full, you know, the fullest extent of enjoyment that they can have. What's your secret? How have you learned to foster that love for the water and the land? You know, I think it's because it's what it's what we love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's very easy to share a, pa a passion that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're passionate about you know the river and the streams and clean water, and you know you've had an incredible paddling experience out there, you know it's it's human nature that you want to share that with somebody. So everybody that works here paddles or hikes or has some involvement with the river and the bay and it's it's easy when you love something it's mm -hmm. easy to share that passion absolutely and so you know we're in an unfortunate time right now dealing with the pandemic and i know a bunch of folks have either been finding a new or you know going back to maybe an old love for the outdoors have you found that here have you seen more folks coming yes absolutely uh we've seen more folks coming more frequently we've also seen people come who have never been here before and you know we've changed some of our protocol with our rental program and our and some of our activities we're not offering because of COVID so we've tried to fill in with things we think are COVID safe so our rental program is all outside you know the check-in and all that kind of stuff is outdoors our PFDs get washed frequently our paddles get wiped down you know everything that we do we try to keep in mind that you know we want to protect people it's been a, uh, I think, a one positive of this whole time that people have realized because it is safe for us to be outdoors and interacting with social distance and in the fresh air, they're discovering all kinds of places to go that they never, probably never would have done before. So a small plus. So this, right. Jenna, not to interrupt you, but I think our uh, stream side folks are ready if you are ready to transition. Alrighty, so we've got a team of folks out on the river. So we're gonna transition over to them. Hey, Adam, we cannot hear you. I think you're still on mute. Start over. They, okay, try again. Good morning, everybody. I'm Adam Miller, our communications director here at the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm here on Fishing Creek with Devin Winland and Josh Hill. So Josh, Devin, tell us a little bit about stream study. Yeah, so we're here on Fishing Creek, um, one of many tributaries to the Susquehanna River. Morning, we had to tap down the river and up into the mouth of Pigeon Creek to come to where it's a, a natural stream. Um, yeah, we do stream studies here as part of our field trip program. Um, it's it's sort of basic as far as stream studies go. Um, obviously, as you guys know, probably you can get very specific with stream studies, but more or less, we use these big nets um, and fish them in, in flowing parts of the stream and basically stir up rocks and, and the mud of upstream from the nets and, the, and let the flow of the water carry any macro invertebrates, any bugs that live in the in the water uh, into the net. And then based on what type of bugs you find, um, you can assess if there's any fish in a particular waterway. Um, we try to keep it pretty basic, more or less we tell the students that if you find a variety of different insects in the in the water that that it's good relatively polluted water and then they can take that knowledge and, 
and they'll have to, uh, you know, their local waterways. Uh, Atlanta has a huge watershed basin. It's about 50% of the land uh, area in Pennsylvania. So definitely any field trip student to get here, um, you know, any any of their local streams at, at a park or house or a friend's house, um, that water will end up in the Susquehanna. So they can help do their part to ensure the water going into the Susquehanna is clean and um, the Susquehanna being the largest single source of fresh water to the Chesapeake Bay, um, that's obviously going to ensure that the, the Chesapeake is also healthier and cleaner. So Josh, what sort of bugs do you think we're going to find today when we're doing this demo? Uh, we always hope to find mayflies and stoneflies, caddisflies. Um, sometimes we see water pennies back here. Those are kind of some of the top, um, you know, pretty sensitive pollution intolerant insects that we really hope to find. And, um, yeah, that's, that's basically what we're after. Uh oh, looks like we may have some technical difficulties. Let's see if we get our, our field team back there. Sorry about that. This is the part of the challenge of having a, of live stream opportunities from the field. Let's see. Lauren, are you back out in the field? Lauren, if you're back if you could unmute so we could hear you. Lauren, if you can hear me, can you please unmute your Zoom? I think we're back. All right, so if you want to do, you know, some screen studying, let's do it. Let's see what yeah. we have. I'm trying to pull it right there. Maybe let's move to a pretty slight right here. <laughs> Yeah, a little water penny here and some caddis water. Oh, here we go, there's a little one coming out. Yeah. Oh, cool. 
Like a dragonfly move. There you go, there's a stonefly. Mm -hmm. So these bugs like to, and that's what they're doing. They're, they're getting up here, you know, just banging around and knocking them off the bottom and they're just flowing down into the net, right? Exactly, yeah. We try not to disturb them too much, just yeah. kind of get them stirred up and crush them. Sure. It was a bird. You can put them in that bucket. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I know. <laughs> I think I got a pretty clear path here. Burrowing mayfly. You can see the three tails. Kind of makes a capital letter M. So that's how we tell the kids to remember it. And that's a big stonefly name. Those stoneflies are cool too. When the when they're in moving water like this, the water rushes over their gills, and that's how they get their oxygen. Oxygen. But when you put them in a, a still bucket like that, they need to agitate the water to to get their oxygen. So they'll sit there and, and start doing push-ups if you if you leave them still long enough. Mayflies will kind of flick the tails. Oh, and we come out our riparian buffer work. Um, um, you know that. One of the benefits of it is the leaf litter. When you've got trees close to the stream, it's literally kind of a basis for the ecosystem. These macroinvertebrates munch on those leaves, and it's really kind of where the you know it's where the food chain starts, right? You know, because all the fish in the stream are going to be eat these guys. That's the stuff. Yeah. Camouflage going to pretty much the leaves and the net. Talk a little bit about what some of these guys look like. What are the what life cycle did they go through? I mean, right now they're you know in some nymph stage they're in the water. Um, yeah. Um, so these mayfly, that's the mayfly. Uh, mayfly. Oh, here's a little little one, different type of mayfly. They're probably most notable in this area because it's been the news here the last few years for just these huge. Perfect catches. There's a stonefly doing his push ups. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, they only live as adults for about a couple of days. But I think the first day is when they're out or at the sun and then at dinner. And they don't have any hours. Basically, their job is to, to mate and then. And then um, so they're harmless. You know, they, they can be kind of a nuisance around here. They can really make a mess and they accumulate. And for me too, as well, I grew up with the east branch of the Cadoris in my backyard. We were in that stream all the time, but I had no idea there was this much stuff in here, you know, until you really start picking it apart with nests and things. Um, yeah, it's amazing the whole whole ecosystem, the whole world that's, that's going on just, just below the water and the rocks and stuff. Um, yeah, it's fun to see that the kids just totally blown. They see all this stuff that's here. Yeah. And you use this as kind of a tool to be able to have them make a connection to this big watershed, right? I mean, sure. Yeah. If we get like a big crayfish, a lot of times they'll name it and, you know, they'll remember it and it kind of sticks with them. You know, let the bugs crawl around on their hands and stuff. And yeah, you can tell it's going to have an impact on them. Oh, 
All right. Well, it looks like we are continuing to have some challenges with technology out in the field. This is the challenge. Do a packing portion of it, um, which is uh, you know, connecting with them to their environment, but also uh, introducing them to recreation in the, in the water as well. You know, we're big believers that um, the more you can get people to enjoy it, the better stewards they're going to be for it. So. Um, they're recreating on the kayaks or we're introducing them to that sport and then they're coming back here and doing the stream study and kind of tying together as Josh said that life that's puts under the water the same water that they were just out paddling on as well. Some are familiar with the fishing and birds in the area, but they don't go quite this small. <laughs> you know, they don't connect all those dots always. So yeah. And these are pretty scary, you know, so I really one of the first thing that's gonna happen. Okay, we're going to go to our backup plan and we're going to share some videos that our partners at Shanks Mare have created. So if you give me a second, I am going to tee those up. Um, just in the past couple of days, the, the significant rains that we've had, that beach line has changed drastically. The amount of uh, gravel and sand. It wasn't just a couple of days ago that all of a sudden it's there. You know, it's all getting washed down that stream. It's getting washed. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. Susquehanna River is known for smallmouth bass fishing. Um, there is other fishing, we get a lot of cat fishermen in the area, but the main uh, sport fish is definitely smallmouth bass. Devin Winan here with Shanks Mare Outfitters. Um, we have been in business since 1978. It is a family business. My parents opened it in uh, 78. I've been here pretty much my entire life. Uh, our store is a uh, old general store that was actually built for the canal trade um, right on the Susquehanna River. Uh, this area is called Lake Clark, but it is very much still a flowing Susquehanna River, um, just a very large section of the Susquehanna River. It's literally our front yard, um, which has allowed us to do a lot more with kayak sales, paddle sports, um, but also a lot more outdoor education for people in our area about what they have. Go about five miles up from us and you get back to normal flowing Rocky River. Uh, the other great thing about the Susquehanna is that every area is a little bit different. Um, you have different scenery, different types of water, a um, little bit different tactics for fishing when you're in those different areas. Um, so it adds a lot of diversity. It's a very large river, about 444 miles long. Like I said, where we are, it's about a mile wide, mile plus wide. Um, so lots of great water to fish and, and recreate. So we went to three different areas uh, while we were on this trip. We started out the Dolphin Narrows, which is north of Harrisburg. Um, one of the really unique things about the Dolphin Narrows is there is a Statue of Liberty built up there, which is pretty cool. It catches a little, you know, people off guard when they're driving by it or paddling by it. Uh, Dolphin Narrows is a great rocky flowing current area for, uh, for some good smallmouth fishing in, you know, the eddies and the currents and, and stuff like that. From there, we moved down to kind of more my home water, which is the Wrightsville, Columbia, Marietta area. Um, we've got several bridges that cross there, as well as, again, a combination of rocky flowing stuff and a little more open flats with some grass beds and, and uh, water like that. The third day, we ended up down at Lock 15, which is looks like a totally different area. It is, um, it, it's almost otherworldly looking. It, it's got large rock formations, uh, lots of channels of water flowing through it. Some of it does open up into, you know, basically big boulder fields with water flowing around it. Um, very unique section of the river. One of my favorite places to paddle um, and fish. We're right at the top of what's called Lake Clark, uh, a dammed section of, of the Susquehanna. And you got a whole series of ledges that just follow about a mile wide all the way across this, this river. So it's a, a good area for smallmouth. Also a really neat area. You've got some really cool bridges. You've got the old bridge pilings uh, behind us, which were actually uh, 
Uh, there was a bridge that was burnt during the Civil War to prevent the Confederates from crossing and heading towards Philadelphia. Uh, unfortunately, they only planned on burning half the bridge, but the whole thing burnt, so uh, they, they lost it. And uh, another bridge was built on those pilings afterwards, um, which was eventually taken down. And then the Veterans Memorial Bridge, which is the, the current bridge that you see behind us, is uh, still in use from the early 1900s, I believe, some, somewhere around there. Um, so just a neat area to paddle around besides good fishing. That, that's an added bonus with it. All right, today we're fishing uh, Dolphin Arrows at Marysville. Um, big smallmouth up here, looking 18, 20 inch smallmouth easily. Um, we're gonna go the whole way up to the top up here, up to the Statue of Liberty that's up there, fish up around the rapids, um, and we'll work our way down slowly and down to the, uh, to the railroad bridge. Susquehanna smallmouth are nothing like anything else on the planet. I mean, they're fantastic, um, super aggressive, always on the feed. Uh, you just gotta dial in that pattern and, and it'll stick. Yeah, so today was a real tough day out here on the Susky. Uh, cold front came in, dropped about 20 degrees and the fish just got locked jaw. Uh, fortunately, we were able to put together a little bit of a pattern, pick up this little chunky guy. A lot of hard work today just to, to figure out a pattern and finally get him dialed in. Uh, so we're out here fishing the Susquehanna River for smallmouth and uh, a favorite presentation out here is what's commonly known as the Ned Rig. Uh, usually it's a, a, a finesse setup uh, that incorporates the uh, Z-Man TRD along with a uh, usually a mushroom head or a Ned head as they call them. Um, and those are great. I love them. However, what we use is the owner uh, Ultra Head Finesse Jig Heads and what they do is um, they allow the bait to sit flush on the hook and the hook uh, stays buried in the bait therefore you know not being exposed and able to catch different debris or the rocks. Um, this makes for a, a fairly snag free and weedless presentation um, and you're not going to spend you know quality fishing time trying to get grass or debris off of your hook. I wasn't prepared for how massive the Susquehanna really is, and everywhere we went looked different from the day before.
morning, sunshines. We are actually on our last fishing day of this trip. Um, happened quick. Kind of sad to, to think that, but looking forward to really putting a pound in on the Susquehanna today. Susquehanna is all about. Waiters always look at me and think that I'm going to have a All right. Thanks again for everyone hanging in during our technical difficulties. Um, I just want to see if Jenna or Liz have anything they want to wrap up with um, before we uh, wrap up our live event, our Brick Breakfast on the Bay event. We have um, one other program that we'd like to share today. It's future behind us. It's called Go Play Outside. So I'm going to hand it over to Liz to, to talk about that. Before. Well, Go Play Outside is um, a trademarked. Um, brand for us. We just launched it on our e-commerce website, goplayoutside.net. And the fun thing about the Go Play Outside story is that 4% um, of the sale of any Go Play Outside product goes towards promoting clean water. So our current um, local partner is the Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper, whose office happens to be in our building. But we've also partnered with Waterkeepers Chesapeake, um, who support seven different um, waterkeeper um, organizations throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. So um, we're, we're promoting it on a grassroots level. Um, we're really trying to partner with, with those specific organizations and sort of take the Go Play Outside brand uh, national. There's certainly waterways all over this country that people care about as much as we care about the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay. So um, that's what Go Play Outside is all about. That's awesome. And what about, so this fall, um, what are the highlights of programs that you guys are offering? Well, um, uh, we're actually starting to wind down on our, on our tours and, and our lessons, mainly because we lose, you know, the water temperature starts to go down. Um, right now, you know, one of the roadblocks we always have with running programs on the river is flow rate. You know, we had so much rain last week and you have to remember that we've got 400 miles of water that's going to come past our front door. So we always keep our eye on flow rate. So we have to be careful this time of year when there's a lot of rain, we get into situations where it's not safe to put people out there. So it's always our first consideration. So, but they're winding down. We still have a lot through September. Um, a couple of things we're involved with September 9th, there's a um, pedaling, plodding, paddling uh, program at John Wright Restaurant up in, in Wrightsville from five to seven. You can go on the uh, Lancaster Conservancy website for information on that. The end of September, we have the Dam Bridge Challenge, which is uh, sponsored by the Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper. That takes place right here. And that's a, um, um, uh, paddle or stand up paddleboard race. Um, and then in October, we have the second annual Susquehanna River Plastic Purge, which is a cleanup event. Uh, it's right now, we've expanded to four sites here on the lower Susquehanna River from Columbia to the Safe Harbor Dam. Mm -hmm. And so that information is available on the lower Susquehanna River Keeper yeah. website. So it's a lot going on moving into a different season. Actually, you can paddle around here through November if you have the right gear and your boats are outfitted properly. Um, so, you know, the fall is just the best time on the water. Do you have any more yoga classes? Are we do class? have, I think we may, might have one or two okay. more yoga classes. <laughs> That's really water temperature dependent because no yoga is going to go in the water when it's cold. Um, but yeah, we have some more of that coming up. So yeah, there's still a lot going on. You can go on, on Shanksmere's website, shanksmere.com and look at all of our programs and register for anything online. Well, thank you for all that you do. It's, it's such a beautiful place and I love learning more about it and all the passion behind it. Well, we really appreciate being able to share our story and 
and uh, a partner with you guys, and we, we all care about the same thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jenna. Liz, thanks for having us this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks for sharing. And again, for all you do for cleaner water in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so thanks to everyone for, for sticking uh, with us through all of our technical challenges today. Um, I just want to, I did just wanted to say thank you again. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank our donors who have made this talk possible in honor of our 50 years uh, of on the ground work. Our generous board of directors has provided a 25,000 gift, a dollar gift to match any donations made to the Alliance this summer. So if you donate this summer, your gift will be matched one-to-one -one, and we hope you'll help us double the the matching gifts so we can continue to restore the lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay for the next 50 years. Um, so thanks so much for joining us and um, we hope we will see you back here on Zoom again soon and have a wonderful Tuesday everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs>